This message is one of the Times Square Church pulpit series. It was recorded in the sanctuary of Times Square Church in Manhattan, New York City. Other tapes are available by writing World Challenge, P.O. Box 260, Lindale, Texas, 75771, or calling 903-963-8626. None of these messages are copyrighted, and you are welcome to make copies for free distribution to friends. It's my all in all. Praise the Lord. Now, now remember, please, if you have enrolled in the Bible school, you, you need to be here Friday night for the orientation. You'll get to meet the teachers. You'll get to get assignments and, and uh, know exactly what to do. It's like first day at school. You don't want to just go there unless you know where you go to the classes and everything. Amen. You're going back to school, folks. Go back to school, Bible school, amen. 1,500 or more enrolled already. People from other churches are calling in, but we're going to have to just cut it off here very, very soon, amen. I want to finish uh, the third part of a message on uh, America's last call. And uh, <clears throat> I've been asking the Lord, trying to understand why he would ask me to... Uh, bring forth such a warning, and uh, I've been warning for a long time. It's been almost 20 years that I've been warning America, and books like Racing Toward Judgment, The Vision, uh, Set the Trumpet to Thy Mouth, many books warning, went out to millions of copies all over the world, but uh, I got weary of it for a while, but I prayed, Lord, I, you're showing me things, and I'm seeing things, and I, I just can't be quiet. I, there's a fire burning in my bones. I've been talking a long time about the riots that are coming to America again and the fires. I see a, over a 1,000 fires burning here in New York City at one time, and people get weary of it. You know, the good times, and it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. But one of the reasons, perhaps, why he chose this particular watchman to warn is because I have probably one of the largest evangelical mailing lists in America or the world. With over nearly a million people. And he's given me a good name. He's preserved it for his honor so that the word is heard and respected. And uh, I'm not talking about some dream or vision. I'm not talking about voices that I've heard. This is a clear examination of the word of God and seeing what the scripture says about our times. <clears throat> I want you to turn tonight to Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, please. I want you to go to verse, verses 22. Uh, let's start at verse 21. Hebrews 10, beginning verse 21. And having a high priest over the house of God... Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. I want you to quote with me that last line. For he is faithful that promised. Again, he is faithful that promised. That's the message. Heavenly Father, I pray tonight that you strengthen us by your word. You encourage your people tonight. Lord, we, we tremble sometimes when we see what is coming. I remember years ago when you spoke to my heart that there would be over 500 fires and oil wells burning in, in uh, the Mideast, and people laughed. And then one day, Lord, when I was watching news, I was shocked to hear 505 wells burning in Iran, uh, in Iraq. Lord, I, I see these things coming, and sometimes I wonder if people want to hear. But, Lord, you said you'll do nothing until you warn your people. You will warn your servants and your watchmen and your prophets, and you will speak. But, Lord Jesus, at the same time you send warnings to the wicked and the unrighteous, you send hope and uh, encouragement to your people. And I pray, Lord, that you open our eyes so we understand what is coming. But at the same time and simultaneously, Lord, that you put a word in our heart that will see us through, that God has everything under control for the children of God. 
Lord, speak clearly to our hearts and our minds and give me your words. Let them not be mine, but they be yours, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah the prophet tells us what's going to happen just in the last days prior to the setting up of the kingdom of Christ. The Lord said he's going to come and judge all the nations. I'm reading from, don't turn it, but I'm reading from Isaiah, the second chapter, begins the 11th verse. The lofty looks of men shall be humbled. The Lord of hosts shall come against everyone that's proud and lofty. And all, all high towers and fence, fenced walls upon all trading ships and pleasant things. The loftiness of man shall be bowed down. The haughtiness of men shall be made low. The idols he shall utterly abolish. They shall run to the holes of the rocks and into caves for fear of the Lord when he ariseth to shake terribly the nations of the earth. Now, according to Isaiah, the shaking of all nations will be so terrifying that people will literally cast their idols of silver and gold to the moles and the bats. It's going to get so bad in this terrible shaking. In fact, the word in Hebrew means a dreadful shaking. In this dreadful shaking, they're going to try to seek a place of shelter, a hiding place. They're going to run to the mountains and into the rocks and into the caves. And in the process, their gold and their silver, those things that they trusted in, are going to be so devalued, they cast them and throw them away. I, I have been saying that for years. I, I prophesied 15 years ago there would be a scandal in Swiss banks. And nobody would believe it. The, the strongest institution, banking institutions in the world. And then we find out this past two years that the, the Germans were taking money from the Jews that they had killed and murdered, storing it in Swiss banks. And now that's all that terrible, terrible thing is coming out. This awful abomination of the Swiss banks taking the money of the murdered Jews and stashing it away. Bible says God's going to come and he's going to shake every nation. Not just one nation, going to shake all nations. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, in the New Testament, this terrifying shaking is confirmed. God says once more, or one last time, this is Hebrews 12, 26. I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. God said, last days, one more time, I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken. Every institution, everything that man trusts in, I am going to shake it. The only thing that's going to be left are those things that can't be shaken. Brother, sister, that is your faith in Jesus Christ and his promises. I believe we're seeing now that very shaking. It started in the Pacific Rim three months ago. Bankers from all over the world were rushing, and their emissaries and their representatives were rushing into Indonesia, into Korea, and, and to... Uh, Singapore and all of those Asian rim nations pouring billions of dollars in it. Our stock market, some of our portfolios here have 25 and 30 percent of their portfolio with retirement funds and Social Security funds dumped into this, these Asian nations. And three months ago, if you'd have gone to Malaysia or Indonesia, you would have seen Mercedes Benz. Uh, uh, racing all through the land. You would have seen women in their finery parading on the streets. You would have seen a prosperous, prosperous society. Same in Korea. Shiny new factories everywhere you turned. What happened, nobody can explain, but overnight, the balloon began to break. It burst. And now will I stand here this very moment in Indonesia, for example, in spite of over $40 billion in uh IMF funds, international monetary funds, they can't stop the bleeding. They can't stop the uh, horrible failure in their banks and their currency. Uh, currency's lost 80 percent, or the stock market there's lost 80 percent of its value. Real estate is gone. And this past two weeks, those Mercedes who three months ago were racing through the land and everybody flaunting their wealth, now they have empty lots filled if you saw the story in New York Times and on the news, those empty lots are full now of Mercedes and furs and jewels being auctioned off for any amount of cash because all their paper wealth is gone. Overnight it was gone. In Korea, 
anticipating millions of unemployed as factories are closing left and right, the 11th most prosperous nation in the world, and overnight it was shaken. Indonesia, Malaysia, all of the Pacific area, and folks, this was where our exports were going, especially in the media and in, in uh, all kinds of uh, new, new media that we are uh, manufacturing here in the United States, especially computers. There's a shaking, and now that cloud is hanging over America. And now the stock market that said it, it is so isolated, insulated, nothing that happens in the world can shake us. Now it is shaking. The stock market this past week, I, I stood here last Sunday night when the stock market was an all-time high, and last week it fell 400 points. And this next week is going to shake from top to bottom. There may be a moment or two where it looks like it's going to subside and everyone will breathe and say, oh, just another little storm. We're going to make it through again. The pride and arrogance here in Wall Street. They think it will never end. There are young men right down here, not many blocks from where I preach on Wall Street right now, young men who've never known a hard time. They've known nothing but wealth. They've known nothing but... Uh, the arrogance of money and pride, they don't know hard times. And they're investing like drunken sailors. They can't believe that overnight it could happen. <clears throat> we see this terrible cloud over the United States. The same cloud that came over the Russian Empire not too long ago, proud of its armies, a solid economy at that time. And suddenly God pulls down the wall. The Iron Curtain goes. Suddenly, overnight, people are pulling off hunks of it and selling it for $100 for a piece of the Iron Curtain. And now that mighty empire has been... Splittered into pieces, ethnic against ethnic, ethos against, uh, ethos against ethos. These, these uh, satellite of Russia now are fighting with one another. The economy is gone. God did it over and he shook it. You and I have lived to see it. You and I have lived to see prosperous Yugoslavia. You remember when they had the Winter Olympics in Sarajevo? And all those beautiful pictures of a very picturesque Sarajevo and all of the quaint little villages and the majestic cathedrals. Overnight it was gone and bombs were falling. It was all over. And now the nation is divided into Karats and Serbs and Muslims fighting with one another in a very fragile peace. Now, you tell me American friends, you tell me that God is going to shake Asia, he's going to stake Russia, and he's going to stake all, shake all of these. Some of these nations didn't allow pornography, didn't allow abortion. In Singapore, you can't even spit on the streets without paying a $50 fine. You tell me that God is not going to shake America? He said, I'm going to rise and shake everything that can be shaken. But folks, let me tell you something. Before the shaking, God first sends servants and he sends his prophets and he sends his watchmen to warn. He said, ah, rising up early means, and I told you this, rising up before it happens. And here's God's warning to the wicked. Woe unto the wicked. He's talking about when the time of shaking comes. Woe to the wicked. It shall be ill. With him, it's really sad. It's going to be a sad time for him. For the reward of his hand shall be given him. God said, I'm going to reward you for your apostasy. You're mocking me. You're pushing me out of your society. You're, you're bleeding of the babies, the bloodshed, the violence, the wickedness, the pornography, the homosexuality that is flaunted in our faces. God says, now you're going to get the reward of your wickedness. And that's about to come. But here, at the same time, the same prophets are speaking a word to the saints, to the righteous. And here's the word from the same prophet Isaiah. First he says, woe to the wicked, it shall be with him. But say ye to the righteous, that it shall be well with them. 
for they shall eat of the fruit of their doings. He said, those who have faith are going to taste the fruit of it. Those who have faith in God's promises. Folks, faith is not of any value unless it is anchored in the promises of God. Faith is nothing more, nothing less than believing that he who promised is faithful. That is faith. You can't measure it any other way. Faith can't be explained any other way. I'm tired of trying to find, hear people trying to explain faith to me. Faith is nothing more, nothing less than believing that he that is promised is faithful. He's going to keep his word. Glory be to God. Years ago, many, many years ago, the Methodist preacher John Wesley was on, his, on a boat to the United States on a ship. And it hit a storm, a violent storm. It looked like the ship was going down. And people were running all over the ship in panic and screaming and crying out to God for mercy. Sailors and even the captain of the ship was crying out to God for mercy. And many of missionaries and Christians aboard who were panic-stricken. But a little group of praying Moravians sat on the deck just holding on, singing quietly, worshiping the Lord. Wesley later said, how could you be so calm in that storm? They said, we have learned to trust the promises of God. We have learned to trust the promises of God. Let me tell you why it's going to be well with the righteous when the shaking comes. We're going to learn that he is faithful and we are going to learn to live by faith. We're going to learn to live by faith and God is going to keep his children because of the investment he's made in them. God made an investment in you when you were still in your mother's womb. I want to show you something here tonight. I want to show you something. Listen, I believe, you know, when, when, when it says of Jesus, when the scribes verse came to him, questioning and throwing all these doubts, the Bible said the Lord knew their minds. He knew what was in their minds. I, I, I believe in the foreknowledge of God. I don't believe in a form, uh, limited foreknowledge. I believe that God had a foreknowledge that has nothing to do to interrupt the perfect, uh, uh, the free will of man. In other words, God knew when you're still in your mother's womb how you would react to his mercy and grace. He knew that you would choose. So that you that are here now, it's not an accident that you were saved. It's not some happenstance that you're here now worshiping the Lord, loving Jesus with all your heart. It's not an accident, folks. It's not a happenstance. God knew it all along. God has been faithful to you. God has an investment in you since you were in the mother's womb. And he's not about to let go of that investment. I don't care what happens to the world. You're his interest here on this earth. You and I as his people, we are his only interest here. He's not interested in any real estate. He owns it all anyhow. The wicked who have, who have terminally rejected him, that is not his interest. His interest is still in those who respond to his grace. But he knew from the very beginning who would respond to his grace, and he knew that. David said, Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in silence. In the book all my members were written when in continuance which in continuance were fastened, when as yet there was none of them. He said, I was just an embryo. I was just beginning. My, my, my members hadn't even been added to this embryo. I hadn't even been fully formed, but God was already writing it all down in his book. But thou art he that took me out of the womb, didst make me hope when I was in my mother's breast. David said, I, I was born to trust God before the sons of men. God created you. You are here now. I'm not talking about some kind of, of, of predestinated election. You're predestined, you were predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. All of us. But God knew. He knows all who would receive the call that one day His grace would lay hold upon you. David said, from the very womb, God knew. God touched me. God covered me in the womb.
God looked down through David's life. He knew every failure. He knew about Bathsheba coming. He knew about the murder of Uriah. He knew all these things because God knows it all from the beginning. Yet he said, my hand, my eternal purpose is on this man. And God kept that man through everything. Through one evil report after another. David, before he dies, he said, I'm old and gray. But I've never seen God forsake the righteous or his seat beg for bread. You've got to measure that. Looking back over David's life, measure the power of that statement. Because David had been through one storm after another. He's about to face his last day. He's looking back. He says, I know what it is not to know where my next meal is coming from. I know what it's like to have to lose everything and be driven out of your home and hide in a cave. I know what it is to be rejected and hounded and hunted like a wild animal. I know what it is to have soldiers come to me and say there's an army coming from the north and there's an army coming from the south. You're being invaded. I know what it is to stand before formidable enemies and iron chariots. Armies bigger and greater than mine. But now I'm old and gray. And I'm here to tell you, I have never once seen God fail. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said, my enemies daily tried to swallow me up. For they were many that fought against me. For what time I was afraid, I trusted in him. In God, I praise his holy word. In God, I put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can ever do to me. I'll not fear what the economy can do to me. I'll not fear what unemployment can do to me. I won't fear what any man can do to me. I trust in God. You and I have been given the very same promises. We have to live by this. The God who is faithful to his word to David will be faithful to us. Let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy, because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee, for thou, Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor wilt thou compass him about as with a shield. God said, I'll encase you in a shield, I'll hold you, no matter what happens to your day. What about Paul the Apostle? Paul, I believe, is the one who penned these words, faithful is he that's promised. Do you know what this man says? It's amazing. He said, it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Separated from the womb? Man, if you had been there when he was a young man, what a strange separation it would have been in your eyes. All you'd seen was a blinded, bug-eyed Jew. Poor-eyed, blind, superstitious Jew who hated Christians. Crucify, or, or out to, to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. You would have said, he's got wrath on him. He's got judgment on him. And if, if you would have gone to Lord and prayer said, oh, God, that Saul is a devil. God said, no, he's the apostle Paul. I've got an investment in that man. He said, from the womb, God chose me. God looked down through time and he, be, he, he saw all of this rebellion. He saw all of this self-righteousness of this man. He saw all that he had, but God one day took, laid seize on his heart, seized his heart. God knew all the time. And he would respond to that call. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Every drug addict sitting in front of me down here and over here from Sarah House, from Isaiah House. Just a few years ago or months ago, when you were on the street and you were drunk and you were dazed with drugs, 
If somebody come up to you and they see you on the street, maybe you, some of you are sleeping on the street and somebody look and said, look, just a piece of humanity, just a piece of mud, lost his way. God says, you don't know what I know. You don't know what I know. God looked down through it all. This is the power of God's grace that he makes an everlasting promise to you, even though, listen, if I knew five years down the line, said, Lord, tear me of all my failures and all my faults, my murmuring, complaining and unbelief, I wouldn't want to go another day. I'd say, Lord, how can you ever put up with me? I'm glad he hides my future. I'm glad he's the only one who knows what I'm like and what I'm going to be like. But I can still say that he made me a promise. No matter what, he's going to keep it. He kept it to a, a murdering, adulterous David. He kept it to a Jew who tried to kill all of his saints that he could get his hands on. Because the Lord saw something in the heart. Years ago, I saw a mau mau on the corner slap my face and said, go to hell and spit on me. And I went home and said, when I've met the worst devil in New York. The most hateful. I'm still feeling the sting. And I'm telling God, he's the devil. And God says, he didn't tell me, but you know, God was saying, no. He's an evangelist. He's going thousands of souls. You see, when God makes an investment in you, do you think he's going to give up on you just because the economy shakes a little? You think you're going to give up on you? He made you an eternal promise. God's promises do not change. They don't change with the times. God said he's unchangeable. You may not believe them, but they're still there and they don't change. The same promises he made to David, he made to Saul, or to Paul the Apostle, he's made to you, he's made to me. Glory be to God. Bless the name of Jesus. <clears throat> In hard times, here's the second thing I want to share with you now. In the hard times... When things begin to shake, in fact, when the shaking becomes terrifying, we have an opportunity to get to know God's glory as in no other time. It's imposs almost impossible for many to reach out for the vision of the glory of God in prosperous good times. Moses is our example. Let me tell you what I'm, I'm, I'm seeing in the spirit. <clears throat> Moses has just now received the most devastating word that God could ever give to a man. The children of Israel have built an, uh, created an idol, and they've been worshiping that idol and dancing nude before that idol, saying God is dead. And Moses has just commanded the tribe of Levi, to go to the, the even, if, even if it's your brother, your, your sister, a relative, I want you to slay all the ringleaders of this rebellion. 3,000 were killed that day. And God has just said to Moses, Moses, go lead the people to the place that I've spoken to, to thee about. I'm not going to go with you. I'm not going in the midst of thee. For thou art stiff-necked people, lest I come and consume thee in the way. After all of his time, his investment, and all of these hopes and dreams, God comes to him, and this man is in the most devastated condition in his lifetime because he's just heard God say, this is the end of the road. I'm not going with you anymore. Moses, you take them in. I'll send an angel to go with you, but I will not be with you. My presence will not go with you. So Moses and Joshua take the tabernacle outside the camp, and they spend time there pleading with God. Moses is shut in with God. This is the end of side one. You may tent, that tent of camp outside the camp, brother. Moses pleads with God 
with these words. Exodus 33, 13. Show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I might find grace in thy sight. And then he adds, I beseech thee, O God, show me thy glory. Now, folks, this hit me so powerfully this past week when I, I read that. In fact, I want you to go to Exodus 33, and, uh, because I want to show you another verse here. 33. Chapter of Exodus. Uh, look, please, at verse 13, 33, 13. Here's his prayer. Now, this man's devastated. This, this is, folks, listen to me. You talk about hard times. This is the hardest time because he knows if God doesn't go with him, all the enemies will mock him. That he's, he's lost all authority and power against all his enemies. And listen to, he says, Now therefore I pray thee, if I found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may know thee. This man has been shut in with God for 40 days and 40 nights already. This man has seen God. This man has been talking face to face with God. Now, you know, God does not have a human face. He's a spirit. That this man is saying that I may know. I thought nobody on earth could know him more than this man, Moses. A meek, holy, godly man. And yet he's saying all that I may know. You see, in his hard time, he's not complaining. He's not murmuring. He says, God, in my hardest time ever in my lifetime, I want to know you. I want to know your ways. And then he it cries out, verse 18, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Show me your glory. And I, I think, Moses, you saw God in such an awesome way in the wonders of Egypt. You saw God in a burning bush. You saw him open the Red Sea. You just saw him destroy a whole world empire, a, a, a world... Uh, strong empire in Egypt. You've been shut up with God in Mount Sinai. Forty days and forty nights in his awesome presence. You've seen him as no other man has seen him. You've found grace in his eyes. He speaks man to man with you. You were given commandments in the pattern of the temple. And yet you say, show me your ways. Moses, if you don't know his ways, who does? Then he cries out, oh God, show me your glory. Beloved, listen to me, please. You can know great intimacy with Jesus and still not understand the glory of God. You can know His voice and still not have seen the glory of God. You can be mightily used of God. You can understand His majesty, His holiness, but if you don't have this cry, you'll never see it. God... Show me your glory. Now, I have been in this church for 10 years, sitting on a stage, either this or, or at the other theater we're in, praying, God, I want to see your glory in this church. And all along, God's saying, what, what, what are you wanting to see? Explain it. Do you want to see people falling over? Do you want to see people slain? What, what is it you want to see? Moses didn't know what he wanted to see. He just said, I want to see your glory. Moses didn't understand the glory of God. You see, the, 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 the presence of the Lord came down on the tabernacle. People were awed when the presence of the Lord was on this man. He had the presence of the Lord. He had intimacy. He knew the voice of God, yet he'd never seen the glory. And folks, for years, I've prayed for I've never seen it until my last years. What the glory of the Lord really is. And we're going to see it now. Verse 19, 33, 19. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. You know what the Lord does? The Lord says, all right, you want to see my glory? I'm going to show it to you now. I'm going to describe my glory to you so that never again in your life Will you ever doubt what my glory is? Folks, I want to show you the glory of God. So that wherever you are, you say, I know now. I don't care what church you visit. 
I don't care where you go. I don't care what anybody tells you about the glory of God. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. It's the glory of God. Hallelujah. Are you ready to know what the glory of God is? It's not 2,000 people shouting and dancing and talking in tongues. Thank God for that. If, that's, if, if, if God chooses to do that, I told him, I'll never stand in your way. If, if it's some kind of excitement where, where you just hear like thunder of praises, it's not the glory of God. God says, Moses, I'm going to hide you in a cleft of the rock. I'm going to put my hand over your face, but I'm going to talk to you. It's not something he saw. It's something he had to know about God. The glory of God is something. It's not about what you feel. It's not some sensory thing. It is something, a revelation. It's a knowledge of what God is, who he is. Mm. All right, let's go to, let's get the revelation of the glory of God. You ready? Chapter 34, beginning verse 5. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed. Now, here's the glory of God. It's a revelation of who God is. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and read it with me out loud. The Lord. The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and they will by no means clear the guilty, visiting iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. All right, now look at me, please. The goodness of God is the glory of God. The mercy and the grace of God is his glory. The goodness of God is his glory. He said, show me your glory, and God is showing you his glory right there. And you know what he's saying? You cannot know a commanding God till you know the promising God. What he's saying to Moses, Moses, you've seen Mount Sinai, you've seen the thunder, you've seen the lightning, you've seen the holiness of God, you've seen the majesty of God. But before, you've got, you've got those commandments and all you know is a commanding God. You've known me as a commanding God. And you can't take those commandments and nobody can fulfill them. Nobody can understand. They'll bring nothing but death until you understand I'm a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Until you understand I'm a God. God. Not only holy, but I'm God. I'm gracious, I'm merciful to my people. He said, don't you dare go down with those commandments until you see my glory. My glory is my goodness. Unmerited. You can't conquer your sin. You can't obey the commandments. You take the promises out of the book and you've got nothing but dead bones. He's saying, Moses, those commandments, you broke them, yes. I'm telling you, you'll break them again. You can't keep them till you know my promises to lay hold of you and keep you from falling. That I will send the Spirit of the living God upon you. And everything I command you, I'll give you the power to obey. Hallelujah. Do you know what you're going to see when hard times come? If you believe that he that promised is faithful, you're going to see the glory of God revealed in you. You know what that is? You're going to see the goodness of God. Every day of your life, there's going to be another revelation of the goodness and the mercy and the grace and the long suffering. God says, no, I'm not going to excuse the wicked. But folks, that's to the wicked. It's not that part of the message is not to the righteous, it's to the wicked. On the wicked, I'll pass down their sins to the third generation. But for you, I have not ordained wrath, but mercy. Glory to God. Many Christians have known only a commanding God. They've never known the promising God. 
You cannot love God as he wants to be loved unless you know him as a promising God. If all you know him is a God of wrath, you're bringing nothing but ruin and destruction on your soul. Because you have to believe that all of his commands come out of a promising hand. Out of a heart of love for his people. Oh, that God could speak to our hearts tonight of his great love. The Lord knows all about what's coming. He knows the good times, knows the bad times. He knows how you, he knows every time you're going to murmur from now till Jesus comes or you die. He knows every bad word you're going to think and every thought of it. And all, he's saying, all I ask you to do is come and trust my power. Come and just seek me with all your face and put your life in my hands. Trust me that I will convict you when you go astray. I'll convict you. I'll be faithful because that's the word the Holy Ghost. Convict of sin of righteousness and judgment. But you've got to believe that I love you first of all. That in mercy I chose you from the womb. I knew all about it. And you're here now in my divine eternal order. And the God that saved you is going to keep you. If he could save you through all your past life, that you have failed him, he called you from the womb, and if he could get through to you after all of your rebellion and your stubbornness and your drugs, your alcohol, your cursing, your smoking, your drinking, and God delivered you! You think for a moment he's going to let go? No, 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 no. He said, you're mine and you're the palm of my hand and I'm going to keep you. I'll tell you what. The Bible says that the sin, the one sin that can keep you from all of these good things is unbelief. This is the sin that kept Israel out, and this will keep you out from the rest that you have to have in hard times. You have to come right into that perfect rest where you know God has everything under control, and that God's going to keep you by His grace and mercy. But he that believeth not God hath made him a liar. Now, the worst thing you could say to a man or woman is, I don't believe you, you're a liar. Nobody wants to be called a liar. But God will not endure, because when you begin to doubt, when you begin to... to, to murmur and complain. You have called God liars. If you're saying, the God who saved me can't keep me. Well, he can, he can keep me maybe three months in hard times, but a whole year, two years, three years, you make God a liar. The scripture says, he that believeth not God hath made him a liar. But he that receives his testimony... He said to his seal that God is true. Folks, I want a testimony in hard times. I preached in the good times that God can keep us from falling, present us faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. Folks, I'm going to be able to say that. I want to be able to say that in the most difficult, when everything around me is shaking. There's one thing, Lord, that doesn't shake, and that's my foundation. I'm on you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, before I close, let me tell you this. Yes, America is suppressing the truth, hating and rejecting the gospel, and the scripture warns, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Behold, the Lord is coming, Jude said, with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds and all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. God says all of those rebellious words, all that mockery of the homosexual community, and all the mockery of those who wanted God out of your society, God said, I'm going to come with my saints and I'm going to send judgments. Listen to me, please. Let me give you a scripture I found today that blessed me. I found it in Proverbs 18.5. It is not good to overthrow the righteous in judgment. God says that to man. Now, if God doesn't allow me to overthrow somebody when they're being judged, when God is judging America, he's not going to overthrow the righteous in the process. He's not going to overthrow the righteous. 
It is not good to overthrow the righteous in judgment. But, folks, the one thing that's going to keep you more than anything else is you simply abide in his love. In other words, abiding in his love, say, I know that God, the, 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 the very <clears throat> glory of God is his love and his goodness. He said all his goodness passed before Moses. And that revelation was the revelation of the glory of God from God himself. I'm beginning to see that you can't even repent if you've just been knocked down by the wrath of God. You come to him because you have a revelation that he loves you even while you're in your sins. He loved you enough then when you were in rebellion to die for you. And it's that revelation of his goodness that will keep you no matter what. It's that revelation that you have to have. Hallelujah. Now, in closing, I want you to turn, I want you to stand and turn to 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. First Thessalonians. Fifth chapter. I want, if you have a King James Version, I want you to read with me the first nine verses, please. Okay? Now, up in the balcony, main floor, choir, everybody around us. In this church, we have taught you to live by the Word. Not by uh, signs and manifestations, though we believe that all of those things are in the Word. This is what will keep you. Read with me, and then let's rejoice in that he that has promised. He is faithful that promised. Let me tell you what he's promised you in these verses, please. Let's read. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. As travail upon a woman with child, they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. But you're the children of light, the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for helmet, the God of salvation. Now listen to this. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen. When the judgments come and you see them falling, first thing I want you to say, these are not mine. I'm not under judgment. I was judged at the cross. My sins are gone. The wrath that's on America is not on me. I want you to say with me, this judgment is not mine. God's wrath is not on me. He's appointed me to salvation by faith and not wrath. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 When uh, New York City gets shaken, this house is a house. <laughs> this house is a house of glory. There'll be no wrath. No wrath here. No wrath in your house. No wrath in your heart. He that's numbered every hair on my head. <laughs> Hallelujah. Who knows every thought that I think? He said, my thoughts toward you, my people, are good thoughts. Saving thoughts. Keeping thoughts. Glory to God. Folks, I don't know, but I am not afraid of what's coming. I am not afraid at all. Pastor Carter spoke this afternoon about witnessing and, and burden for the lost. Folks, they're going to want to hear. 
It's going to be easy to witness. I know it. I know it. I know it's going to be easy to witness. <laughs> Hallelujah. I, I want us just, everybody in this house, just raise your hands and love Jesus for his goodness and his grace. Thank him for his glory, the glory of God, the revelation, the revelation of the goodness of God to his people. A promising God who is faithful to all that he's promised. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to give an invitation before folks. We're going to we're going to do some shouting here in just a moment, but I, I want to give an invitation to those in this audience tonight, before we close this service, those in this audience tonight who say, Pastor David, I'll tell you, I, deep in my heart, I, I really want to serve the Lord. I want to serve with all that's in me. But I've grown lukewarm or cold toward the Lord. I don't know how to happen. But I stand here tonight not really close to Jesus like I ought to be and like I want to be. And I thank God for his love for you tonight. And if you're here tonight and say, I knew the Lord, but I've turned my back. I've, I've slipped away. I've done such terrible things to the Lord. I, and if you don't even know him, accept his offer of love right now. He knows what you're going to do. He knows whether you walk out or he knows when you're going to say yes. His spirit will be there. He'll woo you. He'll call you. But he knows. Open up your heart to him now. And don't anybody leave backslidden, cold, or lukewarm Come and get your heart on fire. So I'm not walking out of this church. God, while you're shaking everything around me, shake me. Shake me. God, shake my soul. Up in the balcony, just go to the stairs on either side as they're singing. And come and join us right now. I'll pray, God, do a work in your heart. God, put fire in your soul tonight. Amen. And if you've got fear in your heart, bring that fear to the Lord. God wants you to walk the city safely with joy in your heart with a peace, an understanding of his mercy and love for you. You're not worthy, none of us are. But he's full of grace and compassion tonight to meet every need in your life. <clears throat> Follow these that are coming. Follow. You feel the Spirit coming. I'm going to ask God, and folks, it's so simple. I'm going to ask God to fill this house with his glory. Right now, now you know what that is? He has to fill every heart here with a revelation of his absolute mercy and goodness and grace to an unworthy people such as us. Now, that, the house will be full of his glory if every believer in this house will fill your mind and set it on this revelation that he's given us. If you'll accept that revelation now, this house and this house is full of his glory. That will keep you. You're not going to be... You're not going to be kept by some feeling. And get, get, come to church and get happy and walk out. And you can go down next day and the stock market collapse or something. You'll go down. But if you've got a revelation, you have the revelation. You've got the glory. And you take that glory of God on the job. You take that glory everywhere you go. It's something that's unshakable. You're on a rock. Glory be to God. All the people that live on emotions... They're going to crumble and fall. But those of you who have this revelation, and I'll tell you what, if you forget what the revelation is, just go back to the 34th chapter of Ezekiel and mark it down, underline it, and quote it and memorize it. And somebody asks, what, the, what, what, did you, what was Times Square Church Sunday night? We saw the glory of God. I learned the glory of God. And then ask, what is it? I've got it here in my heart. I can show it to you right here. You can point to it. You know it. You're, you've got the rock. You're rooted and grounded in truth. Oh, God, fill this house with your glory. Fill my house with the revelation of your glory. Fill this whole house with all the believers with the revelation of your glory. That you have goodness that has passed before our eyes. Lord, that you are merciful, long-suffering, gracious. Hallelujah. Extending mercy. Forgiveness. It's ours. We believe it. 
You're going to be good to us in hard times. You're going to be faithful to us. You're going to keep us by your power. When all other powers have failed, your power cannot fail and will not fail. I want everybody came forward, raise both hands. Everybody standing before me, raise both hands. Pray this prayer from your gut, from inside your heart. Jesus, I come now to trust you, to say I believe you for the forgiveness of my sins. You said that's your glory, to be merciful to me, gracious to me, loving to me, forgiving to me. I believe you're faithful that promised. You promised me all of that? I believe it. I accept it. By faith. I am forgiven. Your hand is on me. And you promised to keep me from falling. I believe that. Now I thank you, Father. Now just love him and give him thanks. Lord, I thank you. I love you. I believe you with all my heart. That's crazy. This is the conclusion of the tape.